All right, what up, you guys? So we're back again with the Restore Passion for God Ministries Bible Study. Today, we're going to be covering Numbers chapter 23. If you was paying attention to the last couple um, chapters that we did, you know that we're at a station where it's Balak and Balaam, you know, basically where a guy is trying to curse Israel. And in the first chapter that we covered, God had interceded for Israel. Right. And in the midst of this story, Israel doesn't even know what's going on. Right. They're they're in the wilderness. They're living their life. They're doing what God is telling them to do at this moment. And they have no idea that Balak has hired Balaam to curse them. So they have no idea what's going on. But God loves Israel so much that he's actually interceding for them without them even knowing it. So that's what we're going to pick up in Numbers chapter 23. And the subtitle is Balaam's first prophecy. Then Balaam said to Balak, build seven altars for me here and prepare for me here seven bulls and seven rams. And Balak did just as Balaam had spoken. And Balak and Balaam offered a bull and a ram on each altar. Then Balaam said to Balak, stand by your burnt offering and I will go. Perhaps the Lord will come to meet me and whatever he shows me, I will tell you. So he went to a desolate height and God met Balaam and he said to him, I have prepared the seven altars, and I have offered on each altar a bull and a ram. Then the Lord put a word in Balaam's mouth and said, Return to Balak, and thus you shall speak. So he returned to him, and there he was standing by his burnt offering, he and all the princes of Moab. And he took up his oracle and said, Balak, the king of Moab, has brought me from Aram, from the mountains of the east. Come and curse Jacob for me. And come, denounce Israel. How shall I curse whom God has not cursed? And how shall I denounce whom the Lord has not denounced? For from the top of the rocks I see him, and from the hills I behold him. There, a people dwelling alone, not reckoning itself among the nations. Who can count the dust of Jacob, or number one-fourth of Israel? Let me die the death of the righteous, and let my end be like his. Then Balak said to Balaam, what have you done to me? I took you to curse my enemies, and look, you have blessed them bountifully. So he answered and said, must I not take heed to speak what the Lord has put in my mouth? Balaam's second prophecy. Verse 13, then Balak said to him, please come with me to another place from which you may see them. You shall see only the outer part of them and shall not see them all. Curse them for me from there. So he brought him to the field of Zophim, to the top of Pisgah, Pisgah, and built seven altars and offered a bull and a ram on each altar. And he said to Balak, stand here by your burnt offering while I meet the Lord over there. Then the Lord met Balaam and put a word in his mouth and said, go back to Balak and thus you shall speak. So he came to him and there he was standing by his burnt offering and the princes of Moab were with him. And Balak said to him, what has the Lord spoken? Then he took up his oracle and said, rise up, Balak, and hear. Listen to me, son of Zippor. God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said and will he not do? Or has he spoken and will he not make it good? Behold, I have received a command to bless. He has blessed and I cannot reverse it. He has not observed iniquity in Jacob, nor has he seen wickedness in Israel. The Lord his God is with him, and the shout of a king is among them. God brings them out of Egypt. He has strength like a wild ox. For there is no sorcery against Jacob, nor any divination against Israel. It now must be said of Jacob and of Israel, Oh, what God has done. Look, a people rises like a lioness and lifts itself up like a lion. It shall not lie down until it devours the prey and drinks the blood of the slain. Then Balak said to Balaam, neither curse them at all, nor bless them at all. So Balaam answered and said to Balak, did I not tell you, saying, all that the Lord speaks, that I must do? Balaam's third prophecy, verse 27. Then Balak said to Balaam, please come, I will take you to another place. Perhaps it will please God that you may curse them for me from there. So Balak took Balaam to the top of Peor that overlooks the wasteland. Then Balaam said to Balak, build for me here seven altars and prepare for me here seven bulls and seven rams. And Balak did as Balaam had said and offered a bull and a ram on every altar. 
So we're going to stop right there because that's the end of chapter 23. But if you guys get any, in, you know, any uh, understanding of what's currently going on, this is a guy that's been hired with money, right? The king of Moab at the time was named Balak, and he hired a, a prophet or a seer, right? A, a, a person that worked the works of divination. So he was like a, a sorcerer. So he wasn't necessarily a prophet of the Lord, but he was a, a diviner. He was able to enter the spirit realm and do things in the spirit realm illegally, right? It is not by the power of the Holy Spirit. So he did this for money. So he was hired with money to curse Israel. And initially, Balaam didn't want to do it. He said he, he claimed to be um, a servant of God. He claimed to love God and that he was not going to act outside of God's will. So initially, he was arguing back and forth with God whether to go with Balak or not to go with Balak. Eventually, he went with Balak and the Lord stopped him in the middle of the road, right, by speaking to him through a donkey. So all of that has already happened. But since he had already went, God said, instead of you turning back and going back home, go with him and I'm going to use you instead. So instead of letting him curse Israel, God used Balaam to pronounce an even further blessing on Israel. Right. So we see two different times in Numbers chapter 23 alone that God redirected the curse and made it a blessing. But we're going to see there's a third prophecy coming up. So we'll see that in Numbers chapter 24. But so far, I do have a couple points I want to get through. And the first one is kind of going through what I just talked about. And the first point is this. To prophesy, it means to utter or speak a revelation from God. And I think that's very important to know because usually when we talk about prophets or even false prophets, we think that it means that you have to tell a future event. And if it's just limited to telling a future event, most people are not prophets. But the biblical definition of to be a prophet is to utter a revelation. Sometimes you do speak future events, as in the cases of David, when he spoke about Jesus, as in the case of Isaiah, as he spoke about Jesus or Joel. But a lot of prophets, they just spoke the correction to the people of Israel that like at the time where they had kings. So a lot of times when kings were presiding over Israel, you had prophets that were alongside the king that would correct the people because the, the king couldn't talk to God directly. It was the mediator set up, right? The same way that Jesus mediates to God through us uh, for the new covenant. Now, you oh, at that time, you had the prophet mediating to God for Israel's sake. And that's what you see, you know, happening. But in this particular case, though, to be a prophet doesn't mean to speak uh, future events. It just means to utter a revelation. So in the beginning, I believe Numbers chapter 22, the Bible says that Balaam is known as a prophet. But obviously, he's not a prophet of the Lord. And that's why later on in the New Testament, when Peter re re Peter references this story, he calls him a false prophet because he wasn't doing it for God. He was doing it for money. So he called him a false prophet. So to prophesy means to utter or speak a revelation from God. And first of all, do you want to maybe comment on that? Do you want me to keep going? Yeah, keep going. Keep going. OK, so to prophesy means to utter or speak a revelation from God. The next thing I want to consider is Balaam's approach to, to receiving prophecy. So he made altars and he offered burnt offerings on them. The reason why I think that's important is because if you've been reading with uh, reading along with us through the book of Leviticus, through the book of Numbers, through the book of Exodus, you know that God commanded them to make burnt offerings as sacrifices so that they could be in his presence. So that's where you get the sin offering, the trespass offering, the wave offering, the heave offering, all these different offerings that Israel was required to make, right? And this is for the Levitical priesthood. You see Balaam doing a form of that as well. So he's off, he's making altars to the Lord and he's offering rams and bulls upon it unto the Lord. So it's a similar practice than what the Israelites would do, except he's not legally entitled to do so. He was not commanded by God to be able to get in his presence but he's forcing his way through. And that's the same thing we see happening in the modern world today with so much witchcraft going around, right? You have a lot of people doing spells. You have a lot of people, you know, using crystals, doing a lot of different stuff, trying to manipulate future events, but they didn't get, they wasn't given access by the Holy Spirit to do so. And that's why usually their lives are in complete turmoil. It may look good on the outside, but on the inside, something is off with their spirit. And if you talk to them long enough, you'll find out, yeah, they're, they're, it's like, I, I just want to share like a, a small story. So I worked with this lady uh, maybe a year ago. 
and we was doing this job. It's like a marketing job. And, you know, through talking, through like becoming friends, because I worked there for like a year. So at that time, she was saying something about, you know, being abused. I'm not going to say any names because, you know, I said personal information, but she had a story of she was abused as a child. Right. And she claimed to be a Christian, but she didn't go to church. So I'm like, OK, that's uh, that's off. And usually at that job, what would happen is because I was an outward Christian, like I said it, I lived it, did the music, I did the worship, I prayed, I believed it, whole, whole nine. So people would come to me with those kind of discussions and those kind of arguments and things like that. So that's how that began to be a thing. So as we began to talk more and more, like initially, I didn't want to talk. So I'm like, okay, that's what you do. I'm, I'm kind of, I'm good on that. But I was thinking, okay, what if this person, what if I need to talk to this person on benefit of her salvation. So that's why I kind of just kept, you know, kept going on with the conversation. And over the year, over the um, year, over the course of the year, I found out more and more information about her past. So come to find out the reason why she was doing this is because she was abused as a child. And what she didn't want is she didn't want nobody else to have control over her ever since that. Right. And it's something to think about, because when you look at women, that manipulate events. We look at women that manipulate their husband in the marriage. We look at people that manipulate situations. It's the same as doing witchcraft because the whole, the whole intention behind it is that you want to be in control. But see, the reason why you're not in control is because of what happened in the garden. Because in that emotional state, you'll make a horrible decision that you're going to regret. But see, the man, he's not going to do that because he's just thinking more logically. In the case that the devil didn't have to tempt Adam. He knew he couldn't get to Adam. So he went to Eve. And if you look at the story in Genesis chapter three, while he's tempting Eve, you never see Eve go back to her husband and run anything by him. You never see her say, well, the devil, or she, well, he wouldn't be called the devil, but she didn't say, well, there's a serpent in the garden. He's talking to me. And he told me that if we eat this fruit, we'll be like God. Because if she would have went to Adam and told him that, he would have been like, hold on, that doesn't make any sense. We can never be like God. God created me from the dust. And God created you from me. We can, we literally can never be like him. That will never happen. He is the creator and we're creations. We'll never be like him. So if she would have ran any of that stuff by her husband, instead of trying to run ahead of her husband and be in control, none of this would have happened. You know, it's, it's cra as crazy as it seems, that's why the devil does that. That's why he goes after the weaker vessel. Because, you know, the weaker people, a lot of times what happened with this witchcraft thing is that people want to be seen. They want to become popular. They want to have esteem amongst other people and they don't have it or they were neglected attention as a child. So they fa they fall into these these different seances, these rituals, this Ouija board, all this crazy stuff. And they don't know they're opening themselves up to demons because witchcraft is not witchcraft. It's not what you think. It's not spells going out and you doing some great stuff. It's demons doing stuff. That's all. It's just, it's just you made a contract with a demon, a demon living inside of you and is doing wickedness on your behalf. It's not that you're great or you're some great Houdini. You wasn't born this way. You just opened yourself up to a demon. So I said a lot. Tell me you got something you want to add to that before we keep going. Yeah, that's good. Uh, <clears throat> I was just thinking, you know, how how God is in full control. You know, he just, you know, and if we we get that, you know, in our in our mind that that we really aren't aren't in uh, we don't have the control that he has. You know, we have control over some situations in our own lives, but we don't have the power and control that he does. Look at this um, in um, Proverbs 19, 21. Many are the plans in a man's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. Look at this. Amen. Psalms 22, 28, for dominion belongs to the Lord and he rules over the nations. Colossians 1, 17, he is before all things and, and him, in him, all things told together. This last one, um, Lord, I know that people's lives are not their own. It is not for them to direct their steps. So, uh, yeah, it's easy to try to manipulate. And like you said, you know, they uh, it's like forming a contract with a demonic spirit. You know, when we're trying to force something to happen, we're trying to manipulate the situation, you know, trying to cause things, you know, to happen. Uh, the, the best thing we can do is, 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 Live according to the word, that's one. Uh, the second one is live according to the spirit, you know, because, and that's what I tell my wife, like, you know, um, me and my wife, I believe, I believe uh, that husband and wife, you know, are to, uh, to complement one another. I believe uh, women bring some natural uh, womanistic 
uh, nurturing traits into the relationship with the husband. But I believe that men are ought to be the spiritual leaders, you know, um, and that you know, I just believe God set it up that way. It's according to scripture that the man ought to be uh, the head as Christ is the head. So he, he has to be a spiritual leader, you know, to be able to make decisions. And I noticed, you know, even though my wife is great with, you know, being able to make decisions, you know, that I have to make sure that her decisions are properly aligned with God. Like, you know, even her thoughts. Like, so she can share something and, you know, um, I'll have to listen, you know, and just see, okay, is that right? You know, um, in the sight of God. And then try to point out, you know, to her, uh, you know, what God may be doing in this situation, because at the end of the day, you know, if we're following what God is doing, we can't go wrong. That's just, that's just, that's just bottom line. If, if we're, if we're really following what God is doing and, and how the way that God wants to go, you know, we really can't go wrong in the end. But when we try to make our own thing happen, you know, and I've done that too. I know what it's like to try to make something happen, you know, on my own, in my own strength, in my own power. And I believe that you, I believe that we have the ability to make something happen. I just believe that it's not a long, it's not often a long term thing, you know, when, when it comes down to a believer. I, I don't see many unbelievers, right, you know, build some stuff. You know, uh, but then like like uh, uh, Prophet Devin was saying, Pastor Devin was saying, you know, they can have that, uh, you know, inner not, you know, not really fully uh, engaged with God, you know, and, you know, you've seen people that were millionaires that killed themselves. Right. They're not happy, you know, um, and they've built something. They built the brand. They built the business. They they built something. You know, they've empired something. But I believe that when you are a child of God, you know, and you build without God, you know, you're not going to be happy. You're not going to. It's not going to last well, well, long. Let me, oh. let me bring a scripture yeah, to man. that. So uh, first Samuel, first Samuel 15, 23. Right. And this is a well-known scripture, but it goes right along with this. It says this. Let me preface the comment. This is happening when Saul is the king of Israel, right? So as you saw in that prophecy that we just read in Numbers 23, it says a king is coming out of Jacob. This is what God was referring to, but this is like thousands of years in advance before King Saul even was born. So he's talking about King Saul being the king and coming out of Jacob and also King David, Jesus, all that, the whole royal line, right? But the first king of Israel was Saul. And at this time, he had disobeyed God a few different times. And God had already ripped the kingdom away from Saul because he says, since you have rejected me as being your know, Lord, I reject you as being my king over my people. But he gave Saul one more chance to do something right. Saul did wrong again. So Samuel speaking to Saul, he says this. He says, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices, right? What we see right here, burnt offerings and sacrifices. He's speaking, he's, he's comparing, he says, has the Lord has as great a delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he also has rejected you from being king. So if we're not following God's plan, even though the scripture says God's plan will prevail, you can resist it unto death. You know, that that we have to be clear about that. It's not like God is going to move without your consent. He's not going to force you. He has a plan. He has a will. And it's the perfect will. It's good. But if we choose not to do it, yeah, you're going to die. Because he's the one that's going to protect us. He's the one that's going to provide for us. He's the one that's going to keep us mentally. Because when we're doing witchcraft, which is, he says rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. What does rebellion remind, remind you of, right? Because if I'm thinking of God's perspective, you have to think about this scripture in the perspective of God, not just yourself. Rebellion is something natural in our human flesh because our carnal nature wants to do whatever it wants to do when it wants to do it. But when God sees a person in rebellion, he thinks of nothing but the devil. He doesn't think of you as, oh, well, God, I'm only doing this because I feel like this or because I feel like that or they did me like this. He's not trying to hear none of that. All he see is somebody that was in heaven turned against me, tried to fight with me, took some angels and made them turn against their own people. That's all God see. So when you in rebellion, he see the same thing. Like, hold on. This is another one of those situations. He hates witchcraft. He hates rebellion. Therefore, that's why he says, is, is, is it better to have a sacrifice or is it better to obey the Lord? 
obey his voice rather than doing what you want to do because it's never going to work out for you. Because when you are in rebellion, not only does God see you in rebellion and witchcraft, the devil sees you too. So you immediately yoke up with his plan because that's what he wants. He never wanted to obey God. And therefore, if you're not obeying God, whose team are you on? Even though you may not see yourself as that, anytime we don't listen to what God is saying, we're saying, devil, you're my God. We have to be very clear about that because people don't think of it that way. We, we, we always try to normalize and grade ourselves on the curve. But that's why a lot of our lives are in complete shambles, right? Because we don't seek God. When we do things, we do what we want to do. And then when it turns out bad, then we want to try to add God to the solution. So you got something for that or you want to keep moving forward? Yeah. Um, yeah, I had a thought. Um, God loves us. But at the same time, you know, oh, when you mentioned about uh, Satan, I was thinking also that's how uh, Satan becomes our father. Right. You know, I thought about the scripture. Uh, he's the father of lies. Right. Mm -hmm. So when we start to operate in rebellion, sometimes it's because we believe the lie. Right. We don't even know yeah. it. Right. It's like, you know, the, the enemy has put some kind of lie in lie in our thoughts, you know, um, like you could be um, on drugs, you'll believe, okay, I can never get off this addiction, right? You know, I'm never going to be able to stop this. You know, uh, uh, I can't stop this pornography, you know, uh, this lust. I can't stop no. this, you know, and 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 you believe the lies. And then uh, the truth is that Christ has come to set us free and God wants us to walk in that. But, but it, it takes for us to kind of turn away from to resist the enemy. The Bible said resist the devil and he'll flee. Resist the enemy but then to, to turn to God. I think you mentioned something um, a while back too that really stuck, you know, with me. I can't probably put it in the same context that you mentioned it, but, but when we're, um, I think we were talking about the context of fasting, you know, something that, you know, you got to replace it with something, right? You don't just turn away from sin. You got to turn to God, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. you, you don't just stop doing something, you know, you got to replace that with something. You got to replace it with, you know, the word, right? The Bible says, how can a young man make his way pure to word? You know, um, and, and I'm telling you, man, and, and I'm, I've am i been walking with God a minute, but I know for a fact uh, we have to spend time with God. You know, we have to, we have to pray. We got to, we got to read the word. We got to be, because that's going to help us be more aware, right? If, you know, we're only aware of the enemy schemes when we start understanding the word a bit better. Right. We 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 could we could be doing all time. I seen people do stuff and they're like, God loves me. God loves you, but he'll love how you live it. Mm -hmm. You live it like the devil. Right? Mm -hmm. You live it like a pagan. You live in your own dangerous waters. You don't realize it, right? You you're in a dangerous place. You know, um, mm -hmm. so 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 that's why it's so important. To, it's the Bible says my people perish for lack of knowledge. So people are literally uh dying and spiritually dead. And walking without God, you know, they're, they're led by their own bellies, as the Bible say, you know, mm -hmm. and, 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 and God is looking at, at, at the world, looking at people and looking at the church. Because the church, some of the churches look like the clubs nowadays. Mm -hmm. You know, where is the holiness? Where is the righteousness? Where is the people that are devoted to God? Commit? Where's the people that are set apart? Right? Not the people that, that, that have become the culture. We're the people that are changing the culture, you know, Amen. so that's, that's kind of stirred up some. Uh, that was a good point. All right. So I want to kind of ground it back into what we're looking at in Numbers 23. And so we're speaking on altars and burnt offerings. Right. So it says that Balak and Balaam was making altars and burnt offerings. Now, one thing to contrast between Balaam and a prophet like Jeremiah or a prophet like Isaiah or even David. When they got words of the Lord, it was because they spent time in the presence. It wasn't because they had a, a ram and they gave a ram on the altar and then God gave them a word. It wasn't transaction, if that makes sense. Like it wasn't, it's kind of like reminds me of Acts 8.20 when Simon saw Peter putting, um, laying on hands on people and the Holy Spirit coming upon them. He says, how can I get this power? He offered money to get the power. And Peter says, let your money perish with you, but you not you have neither part nor portion in this matter because your heart is not right in the sight of the Lord. Because he was trying to buy the power of God as opposed to understanding it's not about 
a transaction. It's about loving the Lord. It's about being in his presence. He does what he wants to do and he can use you to do it if he can trust you. But if you're trying to buy it, he already can't trust you because that means you, you only want to do it for the power. And then what is that about? It's usually about self-esteem. You want to be great amongst other people as opposed to being great in the sight of God. So we see this with these burnt sacrifices, but God's true prophets, like the ones I mentioned earlier, they never had to make a sacrifice to get a word from him. So when God loves you and chooses you as a prophet, you don't have to do any weird situ any weird ritual to get a word. He's just going to give you a word, right? And then when you belong to God, he gives you the word. But when you don't belong to God, it is up to God whether or not he responds to your burnt offering. Right. That's very important because even though these guys are setting up multiple altars all throughout this place, it says they set up seven altars for the first prophecy. And then God blessed Israel. Then he went and set up seven more altars in a different place, burnt seven more bullocks. And then obviously he tried to get another prophecy. And now we see a third prophecy about to start up where they finna make seven more altars. I mean, that's 21 altars, at least 42 dead animals. And you didn't get nothing accomplished. Right. So you see them doing this, but it's up to God whether or not he chooses to respond to the burnt offering. And I think there's something to be said about God doing this one time, only one time throughout all of the history of the Bible and one time throughout the history of the world. Do we see God entering or allowing somebody who's not his chosen people to speak on his behalf? Only one time do we see this. We never see any other false prophet being able to even get close to God. Because now there's a barrier set up. Like you don't just get to make a burnt offering and God will speak to you. Usually you're going to run into demons and devils before you run even come even close to God. So he was blessed to even get in contact with God by doing it this way. But we got to realize this is Israel in the infant stage. This is not Israel with the law and prophets and all these things set up. This is still Israel wandering in the wilderness, not knowing where to go, not knowing what to do. So this one instance happened one time. But look at the world today. We have so many people that's looking at doing Ouija boards, fortune tellers, um, tarot cards, angel readings, angel numbers, numerology, so on. It's the list goes on and on and on of people trying to manipulate events. And they think they're hearing from God, but I'm pretty sure you're not. Because we only see God speaking to one person. That's Old Testament. That's never happened again. There's nowhere in the New Testament that somebody who's not chosen by him to speak in on his behalf has gotten a word. So where are these all these words coming from? Where's all this? Some people putting out prophecies every day. Some people putting out prophecies every week. They always got a new word. Like God told me this. God showed me that. God said this. God said that. He like something not adding up. God didn't even speak that much in the Bible. Why are you? Where are you getting all these words from? That's just something to think about. You got anything you want to add to that? No, that's good. And some of that what you were saying was what what I was even thinking about. You know how 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 being in the presence of God, you know, helps so much. You know to to hear God and and really follow His steps. That's all I was thinking about. Go ahead, keep going, bro. Amen. So I want to get into my second point, and my second point is this: I believe God used Balaam to bless Israel to keep him from cursing Israel. So as I said prior to. God used Balaam to bless Israel. But I think God was, it was like a twofold purpose, right? Because, and I was talking to um, Apostle Robert about this, I think last week or so, with, with the last message we did. And my thought is this, like, it doesn't say this in the Bible. So this is just what I believe. I can't say it's true. It's not, it's not verified. But I believe when God does these things, he's looking out not only for his chosen people, but he's looking out for other people as well. Because God knows that one day we can all inherit salvation. And I believe what he was doing is he was saving Balaam's life, right? Because I believe I talked about it earlier in Genesis 12, 3. I believe it's Genesis 12, 3. Let me see. Let me get it right. Yeah, Genesis 12, 3 is when he first spoke to Abram and told him, I will make you a father of many nations and I will bless those who bless you and I will curse those who curse you. So if God allowed Balaam to curse Israel, not only would Israel be hurting because of the curse that was put on them, but Balaam would lose his life because it says, I will curse those who curse you. So God knows what he already promised Abraham way back in Genesis. 
right? God don't forget, he don't forget nothing. So he's looking at Balaam intending to curse Israel. He's saving Israel by interceding and, and uh, rerouting the curse into a blessing, but he's also saving Balaam because if Balaam blesses Israel, he's blessed. He says, I will bless those who bless you. But then he says, I will curse those who curse you. So I think it was a twofold thing happening with the intercession. He was saving Israel, but he was also preserving the life of Balaam to give him another chance, to give him time to repent of his evil deeds, if that makes sense. And I think that's why we saw that argument going on in the last chapter, Numbers chapter 22, when they were going back and forth between what he wanted to do. So I believe God used Balaam to bless Israel, to keep him from cursing Israel. Israel did not need to be blessed again since God had already pronounced blessing upon them, referring to Genesis 12 and 3. So could God have been preserving the life of Balaam by not allowing him to curse Israel since the one who blessed Israel will be blessed, but those who curse Israel will be cursed? What do you think about that? Keep going. Yeah, it's good. Oh, okay. keep going. All right, so my third point is coming from verse number 10. Verse 10 says, Who can count the dust of Jacob or number one-fourth of Israel? Let me die the death of the righteous and let my end be like his. So if you look at verse 10, this is Balaam blessing Israel. He's speaking the words that God gave him. Now, it seems that this may speak to Balaam considering Yahweh to be his Lord. Because he says, let me die the death of the righteous and let my end be like his. But if you look at these um, earlier verses in that verse, he keeps calling God the Lord, right? He doesn't call him by his name. He doesn't just call him God or one of the gods. He call him Lord, right? We only call God Lord when we make him Lord of our life, when we submit to him, when we believe his ways, his will, his thoughts, his like everything. We submit to him fully. Right. Because we get saved, but then we have to make him Lord. Right. So Balaam is already calling God Lord. And he don't even know who God is. So for some reason, he wants God to be he wants to be in a covenant relationship with the Lord, just like Israel is in a covenant relationship with the Lord. Obviously, that's not actually happening, but that's what he wants to happen based on his language. He keeps calling him Lord God, my Lord, the Lord, my Lord, the Lord. Right. You keep saying that same word. So it seems like this may speak to Balaam considering Yah to be his Lord in the previous chapter. But then it also says that he wants to be like Israel and share in the blessing. Because if you look at verse 10, it says, let me die the death of the righteous and let my end be like his. And this is Balaam speaking the words that God gave him. But he's talking about Jacob. He's talking about the nation of Israel. He says, let my death be. He says, let my end be like his. So he wants to inherit the same blessing that they have. He not only wants them to be blessed because of what God is telling him and showing him, he wants to be blessed like them. All right. What do you what do you got anything to add to that? Or you want to say something about that? Keep keep rolling. I'm gonna jump in. Okay. So my fourth point is coming from verse number 19. Verse 19 is this: it says, God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said and will he not do? Or has he spoken and will he not make it good? So verse 19, number one is this. God does not change his mind. Once he speaks something, it is done, right? And we can kind of go into that a lot deeper. And what I'll just say is this. When you see Jesus come up on the earth and he's speaking to his disciples, and he gave them authority to cast out demons, cast out devils, to heal the sick, heal the lepers, and preach the gospel, he gave them a specific amount of authority. And then when they came back after casting out demons, they were excited. They're like, wow, even the demons, we have power with the demons in your name. And Jesus said this, he says, don't be, he says, don't be happy or don't be excited that the demons are submitted to you in my name, but be excited that your names are written in the book of life. Right. And the reason why he was saying this and my, and my thought is this is because he wanted them to understand that as my disciples, future to be my apostles, you guys have to know how to use this authority, right? Because when they were going through Samaria and people were, you know, they, they were um, treating Jesus and his teachings as almost subpar, James and John said, hold on, Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven and burn these people up? 
the same thing Elijah had done in first Kings. So he says, whoa, 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 whoa. You guys don't know what spirit you're of. No, I don't want you to call no fire down from heaven, right? And the reason why is because as apostles, as chosen apostles of the Lord, that, that authority, you can do that. They could have done something like that. They could have really cursed people. They could have really hurt people. And that's why they had to go through that three years of training and learning at his feet before they were able to go out on their own and have such an authority. Because just imagine what could have been done. Because it's a reason why Jesus has the character he has. It's a reason why he didn't rebel. It's a reason why he didn't speak against the Pharisees a certain way. Why he didn't speak against Rome a certain way. Because that's not his, his mission was not to do that. His mission was to come and teach and to train. His mission was to come pronounce judgment upon the people. But that's what would have happened had he been more self-willed, had he been more selfishly and, and had more ambition. But he says, I only come to do one thing. And that's to do exactly what I see my father do in heaven. So he was submitted to God's will. And he wanted them to, to submit to his will. Because if they submit to his will, they won't just be burning people up and, and using the power of heaven at, at leisure, basically. So that's one thing we see. So God does not change his mind. Once he speaks something, it is done. And that's because of that authority I'm just mentioning. And only in some cases do we see God even have an open mind, like, and I mean, able to, uh, were you able to convince him to change his mind? And that's two, two specific situations. When Moses and Aaron interceded on behalf of Israel, because a lot of times when Israel was in disobedience, God is like, hey, Moses, get out the way. He says, get out the camp. I'm about to kill these people. And then, <laughs> and then he released a plague. And then Moses spoke to Aaron, like usually Moses would just go and pray to God. But sometimes, like it happened multiple times, sometimes Moses couldn't pray fast enough. He says, Aaron, just go get the incense. Just get the just go get the incense and stand in the middle, stand in between the living and the dead. And, and hopefully God going to change his mind. And in one particular case, Aaron did that. And it was a plague going out in Israel. And he stood right between the living and the dead and the plague stopped. But still thousands of people lost their life. Because they just kept being disobedient and God kept giving them chance after chance after chance after chance. And they just wouldn't do the right thing, right? They just kept breaking the commandments that they were given. But God, sometimes he allows his certain prophets, his, his priests, his people that he given authority to go in his presence to change his mind, to keep, to, to, to get him to relent, not repent, right? He didn't bring those people back from the dead, but to relent, to not fully pour out his judgment. Judgment was pouring out, but just not fully. In the same way we, we're living in the world right now, sometimes God's judgment does come out, but it's not the full wrath of God, right? Right? It's not the full wrath of God being poured out. He's waiting for a specific moment for that to happen, because when that happens, that's the complete end. That's, there ain't no coming back from that. And that's what we see. Like, sometimes God is open-minded towards relenting, towards just, you know, kind of, you know, pouring out a little bit and then pulling it back, reeling it back in. So we see that happening with Moses and Aaron, specifically around this time when they're guiding the people through the wilderness. And then also when you see God actually speaking with Abraham when he was about to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah and Abraham wanted to save Lot and then he, he negotiated with God because he said, it says God brought, he brought a couple of people with him, like two different, I think it was like two angels or something at Sodom and Gomorrah. And he spoke, he says, shall I let Abraham know what I'm planning to do at Sodom? He was speaking to his other comrades. He wasn't even speaking to Abraham at the time. He says, shall we let Abraham know what, what we're planning to do? And then when he decided to let Abraham know, that's when Abraham said, well, God, I know you're not like that. I know you're not going to kill the righteous with the wicked. Obviously, Abraham's whole goal was to save his nephew. He didn't care about the people of Sodom like that. He had just went in a, he just went in a battle for to save Lot from Sodom because he had killed it was like five kings in the valley. It was a king of Sodom, king of Gomorrah, the kings of a couple other neighboring nations. And Abraham had went to war with them people just to get the, the life of, uh, of Lot and his um, granddaughters and them back. So he was looking out for his family. He wasn't looking out for the people of Sodom. But God, sometimes the whole point is that God will sometimes allow his special people to, you know, say a prayer or, or intercede on behalf of them and, and not allow his full judgment to be poured out. In the same way that when we sin, Jesus always make intercession for us. So he's allowing him to intercede so, he, so that God's judgment don't fall upon us. So sometimes God doesn't fully pour out his judgment. But 
then again, sometimes he does. Because it says right here, God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent. So he's not going to repent, but he might, he might, you know, hold his hand back and not do as much as he was initially intending on doing. But that's the last point I have for um, Numbers chapter 23. Anything you want to comment on? Yeah, that was that was real good. I, I like how you brought that back with Christ, you know, how he he intercedes for, for us. Because I was thinking about John 17, where he interceded. And 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 when you look at the context of it, he really interceded for the people of God, not the world. Right. He, he interceded. He said to, he interceded to those that are his, those that the father had had given. And I was like, wow, you know, he didn't he didn't intercede for all those that would face the greater wrath. But he interceded for those that that would have the faith, right? Those disciples, and so um, yeah, my grandmother used to have a saying, and I, it, you know, since I was a little kid, she said, "God'll put a, he'll put a pillow up underneath you so you don't fall so hard, right?" You know, and and that's probably you know the grace of God, you know, to to know that you know that His love, you know, His love covers a multitude of sins. You know, and, and that's why he wants for us. He wants the best for us. Right. You know, any any parent, you know, that that loves their child uh, would want the best from them. Uh, that's but that's why he disciplines. Right. He says he disciplines those he loves. Right. You know, so he'll uh, so his discipline is is an action resulting from his love, you know. And so, uh, yeah, I, I just, you know, like to kind of, you know, I just thank Jesus. Thank God for Jesus. And sometimes I'll be like. You know, and I, I live a, a fairly, uh, I'll say godly life because I, I do seek God. I, I can't say I'm perfect. I've had my flaws. I've had my mistakes. I've made mistakes in the past. But the other day I was just asking God, man, God, why you love me so much? Right. You know, why? Why you favor me so much? I'm not perfect. Right. I fail. I've failed you, God. I've I feel like I've let you down so I can feel the anointing right now. I feel like I failed you so many times. And still you love me, right? You still, you know, but then I, I know that God sees something else in us that we don't see about ourselves. You know, for one, he sees godly sorrow, right? You know, you don't just commit sins or you don't just live in, in a, in a, um, a, a, a ungenerated, I'll say ungenerated state of mind where, where you're living as your old self, you know, with your old way of thinking, you know, uh, we're, we're transformed. We're renewed day by day. We're transformed into to the image of God. So whenever the, I, I used to say it this way, whenever I, my old man tried to rise, you know, and he has, my old man has risen. I've thought some words to say, I'm going to be honest. There been some times I were, sometimes I said some words. They're like, you cursed? I was like, yeah, just fed up. I, I, I've hit a boiling point, you know. Um, then sometimes I got mad with folk, you know, and, and and had to have some words with people. But at the end of the day, you know, uh, just knowing that God forgave me, you know, and and that allowed me to forgive others, and you know, just it's just it's just a, a ripple effect. I believe. I believe that that it comes from heaven. God first, He loves us. He first loves us. And then because he loves us, we start loving him, right? You know, uh, I think it's even a scripture that says that uh, uh, about the, the, the churches in Revelation. It said, you've forgotten your first love, right? Mm -hmm. You know, he was your first love. He's the one that loved you. And I'm like, man, you know what? Nobody can really love me more than God. You know, tell my daughter, nobody can love you. I love you. You my daughter. She's right here. I love you. But God love you even more. So, um, mm -hmm. so yeah, I keep you in his hands, you know, because he gave you to me, you know, and, and, and God forbid, I don't want him to ever take you away. So I want to keep you in his hands and keep, you keep loving him and I'm going to keep loving him and we're going to love each other. Amen. But that Amen. was a good word. I, I ain't got nothing else to say. I just, that, that kind of took me on a journey there because I was just saying that the other day, bro. I was like, I said that to God a couple of times, man. I'm like, man, God, why do you still love me? Why? I haven't done anything special, right? I'm nobody special, but you love me, man. Man, you love me. Thank you, Jesus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so glory to God. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Well, you guys, that was um that was Numbers chapter 23. Um, we might do Numbers 24 sometime later, may not, I don't know. But um, 
in case we don't, definitely check out these last few videos we've been doing on the Book of Numbers. I think we have um, a lot of sessions on the Book of Exodus. We even have Genesis. So definitely catch up on those things and we'll get Numbers 24 out to you as soon as possible. Absolutely.